Good morning, church. Welcome to today's service. I'm so glad that you're joining us. Whether you're watching the premiere on Sunday morning or tuning in another time during the week. Today, we're going to hear again from Fiona Miles. We heard from Fiona last Sunday, and she centered her talk around um, that time in the Gospels when Jesus gave the two greatest commandments. He said the two greatest commandments are to love God and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So Fiona asked the question last Sunday, what does it really mean to love ourself? And how does that shape the way that we love our neighbor? And so last Sunday was an introduction to what she's going to share this morning. And I'll, I'll talk about that again a little bit later. If you missed last Sunday, I encourage you to go back and watch it. But if you um, are watching this now, stay tuned, follow through to the end, and then there will be a link at the end of the video where you can go back and catch last Sunday if you missed it. And then next Sunday, we are going to have our next Blue Water Round Table. So you're going to hear a conversation between me and Siobhan and Nathan. So really looking forward to having that conversation and sharing it with you next Sunday as we unpack um, and discuss some of the themes that have arisen from our guest speakers throughout this summer of slow, this series that we're going through this summer where we're learning to embrace the unhurried pace of Jesus. And then one more thing to highlight for the Sunday after next Sunday, which will be August 22nd, we are having our next in-person live event. It is going to be um, a worship service. We will have a picnic and we will be celebrating some baptisms really looking forward to doing that with all of you. Um, Chloe and Anna Shields have asked to be baptized. They're ready to take this step in their faith and uh, it's just so exciting and such an honor to be able to come around them as a church family and celebrate in this communion service. And if you're someone who has been thinking about baptism, has questions about it, uh, I would love to have a conversation with you as well. You can reach me anytime um, by phone or by email, and you can find all of my contact information on our website. Um, speaking of our website, we have a, a button at the bottom of, I think, every page where you can click to uh, join our Blue Water email list. If you are already on that email list, you will have received an email this past Wednesday that is really a step towards being financially transparent with um, all of us because we're all part of this church family. Blue Water operates uh, purely by donation. And so we want to be uh, working towards how we can share in a meaningful way um, some of the behind the scenes of the, the money that Blue Water receives as income and then how that gets spent because um, that's all just part of being accountable to one another. And so that's what that email outlined. And I specifically uh, highlighted some of the ways that Blue Water partners missionally with other organizations um, beyond just Blue Water Church and our drop-in ministry. So I, I highlighted um, Taitu Gardens, which is an orphanage in Haiti. And that's... Um, an organization that Blue Water has partnered with financially for many years now. Also, for the past two years, Blue Water has been supporting missionaries in Cuba through our BIC Cuba um, church planting ministry. Also, I mentioned that there is a new organization that Blue Water is partnering with starting this month. And I'm so excited. John Farrell, our board chair, is going to share that with us in just a moment. But I just wanted to back up and mention, if you haven't subscribed um, to our Blue Water email list, there is a gift for first-time uh, subscribers. It's a digital gift. So if you'd like to stay up to date and connected, we uh, send out emails, not quite every week, um, but sometimes it is every week, just once a week or even less than that. But that's gonna keep you connected um, in just one more way to all of the things that are going on in our Blue Water Church community and drop-in community. 
So anyway, here is Jonathan to share with us the exciting uh, new initiative that Blue Water is taking to partner with um, a local charity here in Canada. And I'm gonna let John explain that to us now. Good morning, Blue Water family. I would like to share an update with everyone this morning about a recent decision that's been made at one of our board meetings. Um, we have been looking for a new opportunity to uh, participate in a charity, in an outreach, in some kind of a mission program. And as we've been looking for where exactly we feel we can make the most impact and what the best thing that we can do with our money is, um, there has been a lot of tough conversations that have been happening in Canada at the same time. As you're no doubt aware, there's been a lot of very difficult revelations lately about Canada's past and Canada's relationship with its Indigenous peoples. And we at Blue Water feel that everyone should be on equal footing. We feel that everyone should have the same rights, the same access. So much of what we do in King Carden is working to help everyone, to provide resources and materials for people who need things and to really be a point of connection and care in communities. So as we've been seeing what's been happening and what's come to light with Indigenous communities in Canada, uh, we at the board have decided that the best outreach for us to do with some of our money right now is to support groups that are doing direct work with Indigenous communities around the country. So we have done our research and we have selected an organization called Water First. And Water First is a terrific charity. They're doing incredible work. They have lots of different partners, sponsors, and with the momentum that they have, they are able to really start making a big difference bringing drinkable water, bringing safe water, and bringing security to Indigenous groups across the country. And not only are they directly working to provide safe drinking water in remote communities that have been under a boil water advisory or have just not had access to clean drinking water for years now, they also are doing great work um, fundraising and running educational initiatives helping to build towards generational change and helping to create communities that are self-sustaining and work together to ensure that future generations don't face the same hurdles that are existing today. So in our research, we have decided that this looks like a great organization to partner with, and we've decided that we will be making a monthly contribution to this group. We feel that it is a safe, way to spend our money and it is an effective way to make a difference in the lives of indigenous communities around our country. They even have done work with our local indigenous communities at the Saugeen Reserve and the Chippewas of Nawash. Um, I would encourage everyone to go onto their website, it's waterfirst.ngo, and to take a look at what this group does. They have so much information available, you can really learn everything about these people, and uh, we encourage you to take a look at this and decide if you want to make some contributions to this organization as well. As a church, we will be making our contributions regularly, and as individuals, you are all encouraged to take a look through the information that's available and decide if you're going to do the same. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. This really is exciting, and it's a beautiful way of the local church partnering with our Indigenous brothers and sisters to improve their quality of life right here in Ontario and in Canada. And thank you to all of you who regularly donate to Blue Water Church. This is just one of the ways that we together are making ripple effects into the communities around us. And uh, speaking of local community, tomorrow, Monday, is going to be the grand reopening of Drop-In. Drop-In at the bridge, of course, has not been meeting on Mondays for the past months, but as King Carden is joining Ontario into phase three of reopening, we're able to start meeting again. So that's going to happen tomorrow. If you have any questions about the logistics of reopening, um, of visiting the drop-in, or if you want some information about uh, what volunteering with the drop-in looks like, you can reach out to Wes. He would love to have a conversation with you. Wes is the 
manager of the drop-in and uh, you can reach him by email at it's the bridge 746 at gmail.com and he would love to connect with you so now we're going to move into our time of worship and teaching and our theme passage for this summer of slow series is matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30. we've heard this in a number of translations and this morning we're going to hear it read from the new living translation then jesus said come to me all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and i will give you rest Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Uh, last Sunday, Fiona shared the verse where Jesus says, I've come to give you life, life abundantly, life to the full. And Part of living life to the full is moving through the world in such a way that aligns with the values of the kingdom of Jesus, with, that aligns with the heart of God himself in the way that we think and act and have relationships with one another and serve in our communities. And that. I think we're learning to realize as we go through this summer series that when we slow down, it's not talking, we're not talking about disengaging of just being on holiday all the time, which is important too. Holidays are great, but Jesus is really inviting us um, to be yoked to him, to be partnered with him where we are moving at his pace, at his speed. We're going in the directions where he is guiding us. And when we slow down, we don't disengage. We actually go deeper and we partner with what the spirit of Jesus is inviting us into in his kingdom building mission here on earth, his work of transformation and reconciliation. It's a work that happens around us, but it's also a work that happens within us in our own discipleship journey. Jesus says right in this passage in verse 29, let me teach you. There's, there are ways for you to grow. There are things that Jesus wants to teach us. And part of that is how to receive his love, how to love ourselves unconditionally in order that we would also love others unconditionally and let that love of Christ just soak up all parts of us and then that would spill out into our relationships. And so that's what Fiona is sharing this morning in really practical ways from um, her perspective as a registered psychotherapist. And she's sharing with us some very practical tools and tips for, you know, when we have really big emotions like anger or sadness, um, how to process those really well so that we don't lash out to the people around us or withdraw and disengage from the people around us because the, the level of health that we have internally it impacts every relationship that we will ever have. And so Jesus invites us to live life to the full and to move through life at a sustainable pace, a sustainable rhythm of rest and work. And um, so that's where we're going this morning. But first, would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much for this time, for this invitation to partner with what your spirit is doing around us and also within us. Thank you that Fiona is here again this morning to share with us some very practical ways to um, engage what your spirit is wanting to teach us about loving ourselves and receiving your unconditional love so that that would positively impact every conversation and interaction that we will ever have with the people you place in our path. And uh, we just give this time to you. We give our attention to you and ask that your presence would be felt with us this morning. 
um, that we would hear your voice clearly speaking to us. And um, we just bless you and praise you. Amen. So we're going to sing a song together in just a moment. And we're going to close the end of the service right after Fiona's message. She's going to say uh, pray a blessing over us. And then that will be the end of this morning service. I won't come back on camera today, but I will see you again next week. So let's sing this song together. All things have passed away. Your love has saved us. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought.
Hello and welcome back. We have a lot of material to cover today, so I'm going to just dive straight in. Last week we used Mark 12, 28 to 31 as the grounding scripture to look at the case to be made for paying loving attention to ourselves. We noted that in doing so, we are loving and accepting ourselves the way that Jesus does. And from that place, we're able to extend the same kind of love and acceptance to those around us. This week, we are going to be looking at some ways that we can start to practice that loving acceptance and how this will overflow into our interactions with, other, with others. Now, last week, I forgot to mention that I have prepared some notes for you to use to track through the talk as we went. You can use those notes to add your thoughts or your comments, uh, anything that stands out to you. I've done the same again today, and you'll notice that the, the notes for today are quite long. Uh, that's because I'm going to be walking you through a few exercises and practices, and I included them step by step in the notes so that you'll be able to use them on your own after the talk. So let's jump right in and take a look at some of the ways we can start to tune into ourselves and practice acceptance of all that we are. There are three main areas that I want to look at today. Our emotions, our bodies, and our self-talk. Typically, in the Western world, the area we are least skilled at leaning into is our emotions. So let's start there. What are emotions? Wandi Kolber in her book, Try Softer, speaks of emotions this way. This extract can be found on page 171. She says, emotions add texture to our lives. They are the feedback to our interactions. They are a response to our stories, physiology, and environments, those parts of our lives that make us who we are. They are the balance to our cerebral brain, and we need the information they give us. In the Western world, engaging our emotions is often seen as weak or self-indulgent. And yet most of us view information gathering as wise and necessary in our day-to-day -day jobs when we're trying to make a decision about how to deal with a challenge or what the best way to proceed is. Emotions are an important source of information, and yet it is not uncommon for us to disregard them or try to ignore them, even when we're trying to make a decision about the best way forward in a particular situation. Aren't some emotions like anger wrong or sinful though? So it's better that we simply push them down or ignore them, dis distance ourselves from them in some way, right? Well, many of us have been told that anger is sinful, However, there is nowhere in scripture that I am aware of that says that the emotion itself is sinful. In fact, Ephesians 4.26 says, In your anger, do not sin, which suggests that anger is to be expected at times and the sin is not the emotion, but how we might behave as a result. And to be honest, ignoring our anger and pushing it down, trying to just keep it out of sight, as opposed to leaning in and processing it in a healthy way, makes it far more likely that we will act on it inappropriately and maybe even sin in response to it. The full range of emotions are reflected throughout the narrative of the Bible. Some of the more noteworthy moments are David's level of emotional honesty in the Psalms. He expresses great joy and great distress in his conversations with God. And remember, God calls David a man after his own heart. Jesus, too, expresses his own emo emotional vulnerability. And a particularly significant moment is his extreme anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus also demonstrates a willingness to be present with others in their emotions. He joins Mary and weeps for her pain on the death of her brother Lazarus. He lingers also with Mary Magdalene in her tears outside the empty tomb, instead of running off after the other disciples. So, if we agree that emotions are a part of how we are created and add richness to life, but there is a risk that we will react to them inappropriately or even sinfully, how can we process our emotions and be with them in a healthy way? There are a number of steps that we can take that will help with this. The first on the list that I've given you is to name the emotion. It makes it feel less overwhelming and more manageable. 
It also means that you can share it more easily with others, help them understand what is going on in your world so that they can be present with you in a helpful way. Now, most of us are good, pretty good at naming our primary emotions, happy, sad, angry, scared, surprised, or disgusted. However, many of us are not so good at drilling down and naming what is going on for us more specifically. So I've included a feelings list at the end of your notes. And sometimes as we read through lists of words that describe emotions, we get that sense of yes, when we hit on just the right one. And it makes it feel uh, less big, less overwhelming and more manageable. There is a whole science behind how emotions are formed in our brains, and we don't have time to go into all of that this morning. Suffice to say, though, that when our emotions feel overwhelming, it causes the prefrontal cortex part of our brains to go offline. This is the reasoning part of our brain. So it's important that we employ some tools to calm our nervous system and re-engage that part of the brain in order to respond to our emotions or the situation from a place of integration. A couple of tools that can help with that are breathing. Now, I'm sure many of us have been told to take a deep breath when we're feeling upset. What we might not have been told, however, is why that helps or indeed how to do it in the best way to get the most benefit from it. So the reason deep breathing helps in moments of emotional overwhelm is because as our emotions rise, our, our sympathetic nervous system is kicking in. And with that, our brains start to flood our bodies with cortisol and other stress hormones. What happens when we breathe deeply is it engages our parasympathetic nervous system, which rebalances our nervous systems and uh, rebalances the the blood, the gases in our blood, oxygen and carbon dioxide as well. So how to do this in the best way is that it's important that we breathe out for longer than we breathe in. So if you breathe in for a count of two, breathe out for a count of four. Breathe in for a count of two, breathe out for a count of four. And do this for a couple of minutes. Uh, as you do so, you will start to feel uh, a greater sense of calm. Another tool that we can use that helps rebalance our nervous systems is the hand on the heart. Physical touch is a great source of comfort when we are feeling emotionally flooded. And so we can do this for ourselves by placing our hand on our heart and just noticing the pressure, noticing that pressure uh, that we are exerting on ourselves. Really tune into it. You can breathe deeply at the same time. And after about 20 seconds or so, your brain will start to release the hormone called oxytocin. That too counters the cortisol in your bloodstream and starts to make you feel calmer. The third tool that I want to uh, introduce you to here is known as grounding. And what that is, is we use our five senses to really pay attention to the world around us. It pulls us back into the present and helps us just feel connected to reality. So we would use sight, hearing, smell, sound, and oh, I said hearing and sound, sorry. Sight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste. And so an example of how we might do that is to use the phrase, I am aware of, and then whatever it is that we can notice using our senses. So for example, I might say, I am aware of the daisy picture behind my computer screen, or the light to the side of my screen, or the noises that I can hear in the house right now. Another thing that can really help us calm down in moments of emotional flooding is to seek beauty, to really look for beauty in the world around us. And when we do so, uh, if we are able to respond with awe, we will feel more connected to God in that moment and might even be able to sense Jesus coming alongside us as we uh, feel our emotions. So another step that we can take to uh, 
be with our emotions in a healthy way is to allow them to move through. Emotions are not static. Uh, they form, they build, and then they naturally subside. However, when we try to resist them, when they start to build, it starts to feel uncomfortable, and we try to push them down and resist them, it actually prevents that natural progression from occurring. And we stay stuck in the emotion. Counterintuitively, when we make space for these emotions and seek to understand the message they are sending and allow them to move through, we will actually find that we are, we are able to uh, let go of them, to move on far more quickly. The second area that I wanted to, to talk about today is our bodies. To love ourselves well, we also need to pay attention to our physical needs and sensations. Now, many of us are pretty good at paying attention to our physical needs. Uh, we eat when we're hungry. We sleep when we're tired. We drink water when we're thirsty. However, many of us are less aware of how our emotions are expressed through our bodies. When we experience emotions, we also experience physical sensations that go along with them. For example, uh, we may experience our heart racing or butterflies in our stomach if we're nervous, sweating, lightheadedness, tension in our neck and shoulders, a heaviness in the pit of our stomach, or if we're excited, we may just feel an energy all over. In a moment of acute emotion, we might notice these things because they come on, they start all of a sudden, and, and uh, we will notice them. However, many of us fail to notice how our bodies express ongoing states of emotional arousal, such as depression or anxiety or stress. Uh, those situations might be expressed through chronic physical pain. That, that pain that just doesn't seem to have a good explanation for it. Or um, maybe chronic tiredness as well. That might be related to an ongoing uh, physical uh, ongoing emotion that we are dealing with. In July, Melissa shared with you some ways to join Jesus in his story. I'd like to walk you through now a brief visualization that you can practice to invite Jesus into your experience and create space for him to speak to you in that. This practice is to help you tap into the non-cognitive parts of your brain. Try not to think of the answers to the questions that I will pose. Just wait. Tune in to your body, to your emotions, and see what comes. It may take practice to be able to enter this space and allow your body and emotions to speak. That's okay. So let's, let's start practicing now. I'll walk you through, and as I say, you have this step by step in your notes, so you'll be able to revisit this and use it again afterwards. So we'll start by closing our eyes or just drop your gaze down. The idea is to not be distracted. Take a few deep breaths, breathing deeply as we've already talked about. In for two and out for four. Sometimes it helps to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, blowing all the way out. Feel your feet on the floor, maybe your back against the back of the chair. Just be aware of your physical uh, location in space. Turn your attention inward and tune into your body. Start to notice where you are carrying your emotion right now. Maybe you're feeling a heaviness in your limbs, a tension in your neck, a uh, tightness in your chest. Or if you're excited, you might be feeling butterflies in your stomach. Take that sensation and place it in your center space, in your torso, somewhere between your abdomen and your shoulders. Continue to breathe deeply. And as you ex exhale, imagine that you are blowing the air into that space around the emotion that you have placed in the center of your being. As you blow out, you are creating an air cushion 
around that emotion. And with every breath, that air cushion expands and opens up the space inside for that emotion. See if you can imagine yourself standing in the air cushion and turn your attention to the center where the emotion is. See what you can notice about those emotions. What color are they? Are they light or dark? Is it all one color or a mix? Are the colors in different areas all swirling together? What shape do the emotions take? Does the shape have sharp edges and corners or is it curved and softer? Is it clearly defined or blurred around the edges? Notice the energy of the shape. Is it static or moving? What kind of quality does it have to the movements? Notice the position of these emotions, the shape of emotions in relation to you. Are you close to the emotions or are you far away from them? Invite Jesus into that space with you. Invite him to be with you in that air cushion around the emotions. When he enters that space, where is he in relation to you? Is he close or at a distance? Are you face to face or shoulder to shoulder? Where is he in relation to the emotion? Is there anything he wants to say to you about the emotion or about anything else in your life right now? Is there anything he wants to give you, either tangible or intangible, like a hug? Is there anything you want to say to him in this moment? Anything you need him to know or anything you need from him in this moment? Turn your attention back towards the emotion and notice if it has changed at all since Jesus came into the picture. Is it the same color, shape? Does it have the same energy? Is it in the same location as it was before Jesus came in? Notice if there are any new emotions that have come into the picture. When you are ready, thank Jesus for being with you in this space and for what he has shared with you or what he has received from you. Take a few more deep breaths and gradually re-enter the external world, noticing the light and the sounds in the room around you. You can use this visualization exercise any time that you feel you have some big emotions or even small emotions that you want to be with, that you're not sure how to process and you want to lean in and be with in a healthy way. Through this, you can invite Jesus to be with you as you pay attention to those emotions and listen to see if there's anything he would say to you or you can talk with him. The last of the three pieces I wanted to touch on today is our thoughts, how we think about experiences and talk to ourselves, and how this impacts our ability to receive God's love. Most of us are so accustomed to being judgmental of ourselves in our self-talk that we just don't even notice it happening. For example, what do I say to myself if I overcook the dinner? Do I say, oh look, I overcook the dinner. Ha! Huh. Is there something I need to do differently next time? Or I wonder why I was so distracted today. Or do I say, oh, Fiona, I can't believe you overcooked the dinner. You always do that when you're trying to do too many things at once. You're just not a good multitasker. In fact, you can't really do anything right. Do you hear the difference? The first is factually true and expressed with curiosity. It has the potential to lead to learning. Learning about my emotions, what might be going on that caused me to be distracted, or learning about how I might do it differently on another day. 
The second way of talking to myself is judgmental. It includes sweeping generalizations and is unlikely to lead to growth. I'm more likely to end up just feeling defeated and stuck in some very negative emotions. Furthermore, I might go on to apologize to my family for messing up the dinner. And if my husband, Matt, responds with grace, the first way of talking to myself will facilitate me receiving that grace and us moving on with our evening. While the second is likely to prevent me from being able to receive his encouragement. When we talk to ourselves, we want to stick to facts, the present situation, and express it with curiosity and openness. Another tool we can use is a affirmative statement based in truth, such as, I am still valued by Jesus whether or not I make an amazing dinner, or I still express love for my family through the efforts I put in. In your notes, I have given you some more examples of affirmative statements rooted in truth. The more specific you can make your statement to your particular context, the more meaningful it will be, and the more you will actually take it on board. It's like the difference between praising a child's painting by saying, I love the blue that you used for the sky, versus good job. The more specific it is, the more the child feels seen and validated. And the same is true of ourselves through our self-talk. One more little tip when it comes to self-talk is to use the word and instead of but. Such a small difference, but it really sounds different. It lands differently with us. Listen to this. If I were to say, I did not complete everything on my to-do list today, but I am still loved by Jesus. I am communicating to myself that even though I didn't measure up, I am still acceptable to him in spite of not measuring up. However, if I use the word and, I did not complete everything on my to-do list and I am still loved by Jesus. It is less uh, judgmental, less condemnatory of the fact that I didn't manage to achieve my whole to-do list today. I am loved not in spite of my shortcomings, but I am loved completely, including my shortcomings. So today we have talked about leaning into our emotions, listening to our bodies and being kind and curious in our self-talk. For your homework this week, you will be putting it all together. Last week, your homework was to notice, to give yourself permission to just notice yourself. And a suggestion I offered was to use the prayer of examine each evening. Now I want to add a couple of minutes of practice each morning too, to set the tone for your day. For two minutes each morning, find a comfortable place to sit and notice yourself non-judgmentally. Notice your energy level. Are you tired or feeling well rested? Notice the physical sensations in your body. Is anything tight or hurting? Or do you feel like you're ready to go for the day? Notice your emotions in that moment. Is there anything that you're looking forward to? Anything you're excited about? Anything that you feels heavy coming into the day that you know is coming up that uh, you are not excited about? Just notice these things. Notice any critical self-talk bubbling up and replace it with an affirmative truth or even just intentionally uh, place that critical comment aside, take the weight of it off your shoulders. Remind yourself that you are God's beloved, every aspect of you, just as you are. You are enough and not too much. No part of you needs to be hidden. Jesus is gracious enough, forgiving enough, and compassionate enough, and he loves you in your humanity and brokenness. Feel the freedom that comes with this. Notice how it feels in your body, in your emotions, in the depths of your soul. Notice how it impacts your closeness with Jesus. Stay in this place of peace, deep, deep love and acceptance for as long as you want to. Then imagine holding this space for yourself as you move into the day. Finally, 
head into your day knowing you can come back to this place of rest with Jesus at any time. As parents, we try to parent our children with compassion and grace, to give them a safe place from which to explore the world in the hope that they will understand God's unconditional love for them, that they will internalize and learn to steward for themselves the knowledge that they are valuable and loved, and that out of that place, they can share Jesus's love and acceptance with others. Similarly, God has the same hope and desires for us in the way he loves and parents us. He hopes that we will be able to internalize his unconditional love and acceptance, that we will start to be able to steward it for ourselves. And out of that place, we will be able to offer it to the other people in our lives. If you are practicing offering yourself unconditional love, acceptance and grace on a daily basis using the homework that we talked about just now, you will notice that you start to become better at offering that to others too. You will be better able to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. I just want to equip you with a few further tips and pointers for how to be with people in their stuff. Hold space for them, make time, choose to be fully present and tuned in while people express what they need to. Join with them in their emotion, as opposed to voicing an alternative view or even shaming them for experiencing it the way they have. Reflect back their emotion, uh, but just by simply saying things like, oh, I can see that that has really upset you. Wow, that sounds really hard. This way they will feel seen and understood. Don't rush to fix it. Recognize that your shared brokenness connects you as people. Vulnerability begets vulnerability. However, be careful not to redirect the conversation to make it about you. Sometimes when we are trying to connect with people, we will say, oh, that's like, something that I experienced or somebody I know who experienced that. And that actually draws the attention away from the person and makes them feel not seen and not heard. Instead, expand, lean in, ask questions, um, use active listening skills, just nod along, say mm -hmm, eye contact, all of that good stuff. And remember, the image of God is present in each one of us, just as you are Jesus's pride and joy, his crowning glory of his creation. So too is that person that you are with, whoever they are and whatever they have done. And invite the Holy Spirit to be actively present in that space with you. As Christians, we are called to partner with God in this work. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 to 4 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. There is so much more to explore in connection with this topic of self-acceptance. We have just scratched the surface. Honestly, I spend weeks talking about these kinds of things with my clients. Most of us have spent decades experiencing ourselves and the world through a lens of judgment, believing that if we could just try harder, we might meet somebody's expectations. We might uh, achieve what we want to. We might find joy. It takes time to create new neuro pathways in our brain that allow us to truly receive the unconditional love of Jesus, to love ourselves the same way and share it with those around us. The good news, though, is that neuroplasticity is real. And even though it takes time, if we stick with it, uh, we can start to see ourselves that way. It is never too late. So I'm coming to the end of my talks. I hope it's been helpful for you and that there was something that has encouraged you. If you would like to continue 
your exploration of this topic. I have included a list of a few books written by Christian therapists or researchers that all address this topic of self-acceptance. They each enter the conversation from a slightly different angle, however, so I will just show you each one and give you some pointers. If you only have time to read one, this is the one. Try Softer by Andy Kolber. It is a really good all-round uh, exploration of what self-acceptance acceptance means and why it matters. It is also very practical, so you will come away feeling equipped with some new ways of being in the world and moving through the world that you can practice and see real change as a result. The next book on the list is this one, Boundaries for Your Soul, How to Turn Your Overwhelming Thoughts and Feelings into Your Greatest Allies by Alison Cook and Kimberly Miller. This one is especially good at helping us learn uh, a way to be present with those parts of us that we struggle with the most. And not just to be present, but to actually embrace them and help them move into more functional roles in our lives. It's a great book. The next one, Get Out of Your Head by Jenny Allen. And the subheading is Stopping the Spiral of Toxic Thoughts. This one is especially good if you struggle with self-condemnatory self-talk. That would be a great one to pick up. And the last one on the list is by Brene Brown, The Gifts of Imperfection. Now, Brene Brown is a Christian. However, she writes for a secular audience. So even though the content aligns very much with a Christian perspective, she is not so explicit in how she talks about uh, faith and bringing faith and uh, psychology together in the same way that the other books on the list are. And I included one further book on your list. I couldn't resist. This book actually ties in better with the talks that Melissa did for you back in July, uh, as opposed to the talks that I have just done. Um, it's called Sensible Sho Shoes, a story about the spiritual journey by Sharon Garlow Brown. And if you're looking for a good fiction read this summer that will also inspire you towards spiritual growth, this is your book. There are four in the series, so there's plenty to keep you resting and reading and growing throughout the summer. In closing, I wanted to give the last word to scripture. This is Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus, and it is my prayer for you too, Blue Water. As you continue to reflect on slowing down to receive God's unconditional love and acceptance of you, all of you, internalize that truth and live out of that truth. Turn and share it with others in your life. As you live the fully alive life that Jesus came to give us, this is my prayer for you. It comes from Ephesians 3 verses 14 to 21, and I'm reading from the NIV. A prayer for the church in Ephesus. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, Blue Water Church, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long, how high and deep the love of Christ is, and to know, to really know, this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>